All right. Okay. So um, my talk is going to be uh, pretty different than the uh, other talks of the conference. It's more aimed at the uh, hoodies in the audience versus the suits. Um, but I will try to make uh, some notes of relevance uh, for those who are blockchaining it up. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're talking about today, and uh, you know, the title here I'll actually relate to the uh, the title that's in the agenda uh, in a few slides. We're going to talk about here today is uh, something that uh, we call the machine payable web. Um, and the concept is a web where basically machines are earning Bitcoin on every HTTP request. Now, who here knows what an HTTP request is? Just a show of hands. Okay, all right. Well, every time you load a web page, that's an HTTP request that's happening. Um, so it's a lot of HTTP requests. So if you're earning Bitcoin on every HTTP request, it could be a lot of Bitcoin, so it could be important. So it may worth be paying attention to. Okay. So. Um, what we, uh, we think is that there's actually going to be a third web, right? Uh, and by a third web, what we mean is there's right now two webs that people are familiar with. There's the, uh, the World Wide Web, right, where you've got documents that are linked to each other, right, uh, via hyperlinks. And you've got the, uh, the Social Web, where you've got uh, links between people, and you've got likes and pokes and tweets and so on flowing uh, between them. And uh, we think there's going to be a third web, a machine web where the links are actually payments between machines, um, and we call it the machine payable web, or the machine web for short. Now, the thing about this is you might ask, why would we need something like that? Why would we want a machine payable web in the first place? And uh, the reason is because paywalls are actually a lot worse than you think. Um, and by paywall, what am I referring to? Um, by analogy, you've probably seen, you know, go to the Wall Street Journal website, you get this paywall over here, and what do you do? You usually go and take the URL, um, sorry, Paul, uh, Paul Vigna's in the audience. You take the URL of Paul Vigna's article, you paste it into Google, and you go and you try and see the article for free, right? And uh, the reason you do that is because you're actually paying in a totally different way. You're not paying the Wall Street Journal, unfortunately. Um, you're paying Google, and you're paying Google not via a paywall over here, but you're paying Google via micropayments. And you're paying them via micropayments in the form of an ad. Okay, so this is the way that we monetize content on the web. It's either via you know, paywalls or it's via ad-based micropayments, right? Now, the issue is that if you're talking about machines, if you're a developer, um, well, you only have the option of using paywalls. So probably you've heard of AWS here, Amazon Web Services. Um, if you're a developer, you've, you've certainly heard of it. Uh, and the thing is that Amazon Web Services, signing up for something like that is very much like signing up for the Wall Street Journal. You have to go and put in a credit card, you have to put in your address and all this information, sometimes ID and all that stuff before you can use more instances. And there's nothing that's analogous to like a no friction sign up process where you can just click and rent a machine um, without any you know, pre-authorization. Uh, pre and uh, one way of thinking about this is just by analogy, again, right? So if every website had a paywall, Right? If every website had a lock in front of it, you wouldn't have the World Wide Web we know. Instead, it would be something that would be more like television, where you'd have subscriptions to a few key channels, um, and then after that, you would not really go out of that uh, milieu. Rather than clicking on tens of thousands of links in the course of a year, uh, you'd click on a few um, that would really be just website-focused uh, and directed, the places you had subscriptions to. So that's really where machine APIs are stuck today, right? They're stuck in this lower left quadrant. They're stuck in a place where they can't link back and forth to each other like documents. Um, you have to go and sign up for each of them individually. There's no circulation or anything there, right? So, um, you know, one way of thinking about this and the reason this is there, and this is kind of a, an interesting and subtle point, I think, is that the way that content is monetized is you have a human and, you know, they, they hit a paywall over here, 1% of them, and they go and they pay for the content. But 99% of them, let's just say, just escape and they don't pay, right? So 1% of them pay 100% of the time. The alternate monetization model is something where you've got a human and uh, all of them get to see the content and once in a while 1% of them get distracted by an ad um, and then, you know, they've got um, a situation where they're a monetization event, an orange arrow, right? But with machines, the problem is machines don't get distracted, right? So with a machine over here, the machine, you know, you might set up the paywall over here and they'll pay, but if you just try giving them the content for free and put up an ad near there, they're never going to get distracted from the goal. They're always just going to barrel right for the API. They're not going to click an ad, right? So machines don't inadvertently click ads. And so because of this, in order to actually have this machine payable web, we need a way for machines to actually pay other machines. And uh, for a machine web, we need a machine currency, um, and we need Bitcoin, okay? Um, so yes, and a blockchain, the blockchain. Okay, so 
now that we've motivated this, right, let's talk about what we're going to do with Bitcoin. So that's why we've built 21. 21 is a free piece of software. You can download it at our website, 21.co, uh, which allows you to build a machine payable web. That's to say, take any machine, any Linux machine, any Mac OS X machine, and soon any Windows machine, uh, and just run some software and have that machine earning Bitcoin for you and connecting to other machines that also spend and receive that Bitcoin. Okay? So you can go to Twain.co, you can download this now, okay? and Twain1 basically makes Bitcoin the currency of the machine payable web. Okay? And let me explain what that means uh, and the features that, that we have in this software. So there's basically uh, three key features. right? Um, the first is that 21 allows you to very quickly get Bitcoin on any device. So you can install 21 and you can run one of several different kinds of commands to mine, buy, earn, sell, or even get from a faucet some Bitcoin to start using in your programs. The second thing that 21 does is it allows you to add Bitcoin micropayments to your app with literally one line of code. Right? In front of any existing web API, you just add this line of code, payment required, and you can say, I want 5,000 Satoshis per API call. Okay. Now, you can actually pass in something much more sophisticated there. You can pass in a pricing function. Um, you can have arbitrary pricing. You can have surge pricing for APIs. And uh, so that's pretty sophisticated. That means that you can go and retrofit or build new applications that make use of Bitcoin micropayments without really even knowing anything about Bitcoin. Just put in one line of code. And the third thing that we've done is once you've built these kinds of applications, so you've gone your Bitcoin, you've added micropayments to your application, now we have basically a marketplace where you can actually go and exchange Bitcoin for services with other people. And you can earn Bitcoin in every HTTP request. Right? And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of HTTP requests, so that could potentially be quite a lot of Bitcoin. So let's go through these features in turn just to get a, a feel for them. So first, get Bitcoin on any device. Right? So this is just the fastest way with 21 to get started in any country. You don't need a bank account. You don't need a credit card. You just install 21 and go. And let me show you how, how you do that. So basically, to install 21, you just do this, curl 21.co pipe to sh. Right? Now, you can pipe that into less or what have you. You can preview the script. Um, but bang, you've got it. Right? You've just installed 21. Um, there's a bunch of commands. This is very easy to remember. So it's like a trivial installation. It installs all kinds of dependencies and other stuff if you want them um, that will let you set up servers and so on. Right? So it's a very memorable thing. If you forget the HTTPS, it will prompt you to use HTTPS. So it's uh, pretty aware of errors and, and so on. Right? And once you've installed 21, we've got five different ways built into 21 to get Bitcoin onto your machine. And you can choose whichever one you want. Right? You can mine Bitcoin. You can buy Bitcoin with our Coinbase integration. You can get Bitcoin from our faucet. And then you can also do two things that don't involve either mining or buying Bitcoin. You can earn Bitcoin by doing microtasks for 21 and then for others. And you can also sell your machine resources for Bitcoin, kind of like an Airbnb for machines. OK, let's go through these in turn quickly. So when you're talking about mining Bitcoin, um, if you've got a mining chip detected, uh, you can just go and click, you know, or enter in 21 mine. Mining has begun. And you can start seeing your, your Bitcoin count up. Okay. If you want to buy Bitcoin with our Coinbase integration, you can just buy Bitcoin over here, and the Bitcoin will just be deposited to your wallet. Right? So if you want to buy in bulk, um, that's easy to do. Okay? If you want to uh, just get some Bitcoin without signing up at all, you're just really lazy, um, well, you can hit our faucet. Right? And we, will, you know, we rate limit this in a bunch of different ways, so don't abuse it. Um, but you can just curl 21.co on any machine, and get some Bitcoin, start playing with it, do some API calls, and so on. You can earn Bitcoin. Okay, and so this is going to be pretty cool because this is kind of new. I mean, the people have sort of talked about a Bitcoin economy where people are actually paid in Bitcoin, but we pay small amounts of Bitcoin for very small amounts of work. For example, if you invite a bunch of your friends to 21, you get paid Bitcoin, and you get paid more if they've got an institutional email versus a free or a fake email or what have you. Right? Other kinds of microtasks like this will be made available. So even if you don't hit the faucet, you can do something there without a credit card in any country to earn Bitcoin for a little bit of work. The fifth and final way is by actually booting up a machine payable server. So while the 21 earn command is kind of an active thing, you're putting in labor and getting back Bitcoin, the 21 sell command is passive. You, you launch a command, and then you go and you get some Bitcoin um, in the background as it's running. And so all these things combined basically mean that 21 is a very easy way to you, know, you install 21, and you can easily get Bitcoin in a, a number of different ways. right? Okay. So once you, you know, have this concept of selling APIs for Bitcoin, you might want to build your own, not just the ones that are built into 21. And so we've got the functionality to add Bitcoin functionality to any app. And so it's very simple. Here's the, here's the before. You've got your web app over here. And here's the after. And you just put a line payment required over there. And you pass in you know, the, the amount that you want to bill in. And importantly, that can be an arbitrary function. 
Okay, request a price over there is something which uh, can be an arbitrary function that takes an arbitrary HTTP request and returns back whatever price you want. You can have a lower price for your friends, you can have a lower price for uh, your, your family, um, and you can have surge pricing, you can have a higher price if demand so warrants, right? So you can have totally dynamic pricing um, and you can have that happen in real time in response to computation. The third thing that 21 gives is basically the ability to earn Bitcoin in every HTTP request, right? So it's a new way to monetize online with machine-to-machine -machine micropayments. And basically what you can do here is once you've built that custom app that we just showed, you've added your one line of code, you've added payment required, you can do a 21 publish command over here and you can submit that to the marketplace. And then others can buy and sell from you in this marketplace because it's a discovery point, it's an index. Like Google or eBay or what have you, you need an index, a marketplace for people to find each other and buy and sell from each other. A currency alone doesn't, uh, doesn't do it, you need discovery as well. In addition to discovery, we've got a community. Um, so you can set up your profile over here. So we've got like profile pages and stuff. Um, and you can go to the uh, Slack community and find other people who are interested in buying and selling from you. And that community is gonna expand because now we've got this, this free 21 software. Now, some of you might be asking, okay, this is cool. You've got this free software. Um, but what about your Bitcoin computer? What happened to that? And uh, the answer is actually, uh, we've now made every computer into a Bitcoin computer. And we've basically taken the Bitcoin computer, which is sort of stage one, um, and it has essentially three descendants, right? So there's a 21 software that I just talked about. There's the DIY Bitcoin computer over here, and you can just go to 21.co front slash DIY, and we've got full instructions for turning anything into basically a black box that makes you money, starting with Raspberry Pis and Odroids, but moving towards any, any kind of other spare computer you've got. You just put it on your shelf, and it'll make you money in the background. And the third thing we've got is embedded mining, um, and that's coming up. Uh, you know, I don't have time to talk about that right now, but rest assured, we, we haven't forgotten about it. This software basically gives a justification in many ways for embedded mining because it gives lots of endpoints that can actually take Bitcoin and do useful things. Okay, so just in summary, um, today we just launched some software uh, that basically builds what we think of as the third web, the machine payable web. Um, and what that software lets you do is it makes Bitcoin the currency of that machine payable web. It allows you to get Bitcoin on any device, it allows you to add Bitcoin to any app, and it allows you to earn Bitcoin on every HTTP request. So if this interests you, if you'd like to be involved with this, Please uh, go and build a machine payable web at uh, terrain.co. Thank you. Let's look at this as in this case with Bitcoin. We're talking about an internet protocol, seven distinct network effects all taking root at the same time. The first one is speculation. People buying it you know, because they want to make a quick buck on it, using it as a store of value, whatever. Uh, use particular utility being built out in there, things like Armory, you know, which helped you secure your Bitcoins. You got to secure them in order to speculate on them, right? Uh, exchanges, so Kraken, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, uh, you need to be able to trade your Bitcoins for dollars, euros, yen, whatever. Um, and then, uh, so that's speculation. Next would be merchants. Merchants are going to accept Bitcoin merely because speculators hold Bitcoin. So this is a second network effect, second order network effect. Uh, BitPay is a good example of a payment processor. Uh, we have major internet giants like Rakuten, uh, Microsoft, Dell, Dish Network, all these people accepting Bitcoin. We have over 100,000 merchants that accept Bitcoin. With BitPay, we have integrations with things like Shopify, which uh, anybody who's got Shopify-enabled uh, web uh, checkout, and there are hundreds of thousands of merchants that have that, they can instantly be able to accept Bitcoin pretty much. Uh, so merchants accept Bitcoin because speculators hold it. Uh, the next would be the third order network effect. That would be consumers using Bitcoin solely because merchants accept it. An example of this would be purse.io. Uh, purse.io, you basically go and you make a wish list on Amazon and then you import the wish list to purse and then you set the amount of discount that you want to receive and you put your bitcoins into escrow and then somebody comes along and they're like I want to buy those bitcoins so they buy your Amazon cart have it shipped to you and after you receive your items then the bitcoins get released from escrow to those people well guess what the average discount on purse is 18 percent so because people choose to pay with Bitcoin instead of paying with dollars or paying with a credit card or paying with a gift card or whatever, paying with Bitcoin, they save 18%. 
people using Bitcoin, they saved $500,000 in 2015 on purse, buying stuff off Amazon. Hmm. Uh, like, why would you use anything else to buy stuff off Amazon? I mean, you don't even have to like, you can hate Bitcoin. You don't even have to hold Bitcoin very long. You know, you just hold it enough to, to get, get the bid and you save, you know, 10 to 18 percent, 35 percent in some cases. I've saved 35 percent on some of my orders. Uh, so that's a, that's consumers using Bitcoin solely because merchants accept it. The fourth network effect is the miners or the security of the network. Uh, we have we're approaching what's called one exahash. Uh, it's it's just an unfathomable amount of processing power that secures the Bitcoin blockchain. We're talking like tens and tens of thousands of times more processing power than the 500 largest supercomputers in the world combined. Uh, you know, everybody thinks like, oh, it's just real easy to start up one of these blockchains. No, it's not. You can get squashed by computer processing power. You have to be able to defend yourself against like Google or Microsoft or the NSA, right? Well, guess what? Bitcoin has has so much processing power Securing that blockchain, uh, I just don't see any other blockchain being able to be anywhere near as secure, which leads to the fifth network effect, which are developers, uh, software developers. They're going to build their applications and their utility and, and all of this stuff. They're going to build it on the most secure blockchain. Like, why build it on a less secure blockchain? Right, um, so that's a that's a fifth network effect. That's developers having to spend all the time and the effort to get acquainted with a code base. Because you can think of developing software, it's kind of like playing Legos with words, right? And so what you have to do is you have to load like tens of thousands of lines of code into your head, so that then so that you can then play Legos with it. Like that's how software gets developed. Um, getting people familiar with a code base, writing libraries, uh, so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, all of this stuff, you know, developers, guess what? They're all building on Bitcoin. They're not building on other blockchains because they're not as secure. They don't have as many merchants accepting it. They don't have as many speculators holding it, which all this stuff goes into the price of Bitcoin. Mm. Then we've got the sixth network effect, which uh, I already mentioned earlier, the CFTC holding a meeting about using Bitcoin for futures and forwards and puts and calls and all that stuff. Well, that that's the financialization network effect. That's where Wall Street really comes in and starts building these these very creative, very useful in a lot of ways uh, financial instruments. Uh, you know, so that's the sixth network effect. We've already got uh, regulated and approved uh, swap execution facilities to write different uh, derivative contracts for Bitcoin. And then we get to the seventh network effect. And I, and, and I haven't really seen any uh, – there, there hasn't really been any growth in this network effect yet. It's still very much a theoretical network effect. But what it is is it's, it's the, the world reserve currency. It's the settlement currency type network effect. It's where people, instead of cashing out – into dollars or cashing out into euros, they cash out into Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, instead of trading like an oil, t all the oil in an oil tanker for dollars, you trade it for Bitcoin. Instead of trading your piece of real estate for euros or yen, you're trading it for Bitcoin. You're settling into Bitcoin. And, but we are seeing this within the Bitcoin industry. And one of the largest uh, software development houses, Blockstream, uh, they've release this uh, thing called Liquid. And Liquid connects all the Bitcoin exchanges and it enables the Bitcoin exchanges to move customer balances trustlessly and pretty much instantaneously among each other. And the effect that that is having is that in order to, uh, for these exchanges to settle amongst each other, they settle using Bitcoin, not using wire transfers. Wow. Right, so that that's the first kind of green shoots of the world reserve settlement currency application is this liquid network uh, among the Bitcoin exchanges. So now each of the Bitcoin exchanges they hold they all hold dollars or euros or whatever. But when customer A wants to move their balance to 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 exchange B, uh, they use the Bitcoin pipeline. They use this liquid network and instead of using wire transfers. We were using wire transfers for five or six years, right? But we, but Bitcoin has now supplanted wires and dollars and euros and all this stuff 
for that network effect. So, you know, we got seven network effects all taking place at the same time. People spent millions of dollars like trying to go after eBay and they failed. And eBay only had two network effects. And you get this cumulative exponential uh, entrenchment that comes from having network effects all taking place. Um, so do I think some other project, some other coin is going to be able to supplant these network effects? I think it's highly, highly improbable and unlikely. And if anybody has any idea of a project that does, please, please please let me know because I will buy a lot of that, right? <laughs> because it's probably highly undervalued. <laughs>